Miller. Here. Margaret Brown. Here. Frank Racino for Fiona Ma. Present. Lisa Middleton. Present. Jason Perez. Present. Shonda Wesley. Present. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Here. Mr. Uh, Chair, all is in attendance. Yay. Good. Thank you, Ms. Hopper. Um, let's go to item two, approval of the November 17th, 2020 risk and audit committee timed agenda. Or Move approval. The committee. Second. Moved by Ms. Brown. Second by. Second by Sean. Oh, okay, Ms. Wesley. Okay, so I'm not seeing any call for discussion. Um, so I'll call the question. Ms. Hopper, please call the roll. Margaret Brown. Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Mr. Chair, I have Margaret Brown making the motion. Shonda Wesley second it for approval of item two. The ayes have it. The item is approved. So we'll move on to item three, the executive reports, and I will call on Marlene Timberlake Piatomo. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, committee members and board members, Arlene Timberlake Diadamo, CalPERS team member. It is really great to see you all today and thanks for hanging in for our risk and audit committee meeting. Uh, before I describe the agenda items, I would like to take the opportunity to provide two updates regarding enterprise compliance activities since we last met. In our ongoing effort to address and manage personal trading, we held a series of mandatory training, personal trading expectations uh, through the month of October. And I'm happy to report that all covered persons participated in this training. Second, beginning with today's reporting, the Enterprise Compliance Activity Reports now include more detail regarding closed substantiated ethics complaints. So that's my two updates that I wanted to provide you. Uh, today's RAC agenda is a mix of information and action items comprising the topics of actuarial valuations, risk framework, and independent audits. Your action items are first, the independent auditor's report for fiscal year 2019-20, and they, uh, they will present their draft report and accompanying required reports for your approval. The review of independent auditor's management letter includes comments and recommendations related to strengthening internal controls over financial reporting based on the audit of the June 30, 2019 financial statements. Management's concurrence, response, and proposed corrective actions are included in the management letter. This item also requires approval from the committee. On May 5, 2020, CalPERS released RFP number 2020-8853 to initiate a competitive selection process to engage the services of a qualified audit firm to perform audits of CalPERS financial statements for fiscal years 2021 through 2425. CalPERS received five response proposals. The independent financial statement auditor selection agenda item presents the highest scoring finalists for the independent financial statement auditor. Upon your approval, CalPERS will, CalPERS will enter contract negotiations with the approved finalist. Next is the RFP for parallel valuation and certification services. We are requesting approval to seek an external firm through a competitive bidding process to provide parallel actuarial valuation and certification services to the Board of Administration. Information items consist of the following. Discussion of the completion of Buck Global, our third-party actuarial firm, independent review of the actuarial valuations of the JRS, JRS2, LRS, and the 1959 SBP as of June 30, 2019 and the Enterprise Risk Management Framework Review Agenda item will update you on the current status of CalPERS Enterprise Risks. The next Risk and Audit Committee meeting is scheduled for February 2021 and includes the election of the Risk and Audit Committee Chair and Vice Chair, 
the review of the Risk and Audit Committee delegation, and the mid-year plan updates for enterprise compliance and enterprise risk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This concludes my report, and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Diadamo. I'm not seeing any requests or comment or questions, so we'll move to item five, information consent items. I don't have any requests to pull anything. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything. And so we'll move to action agenda items. Um, six. Mr. Chair. Starting with six. Yes, Ms. Hopper. We need to take a roll call to approve the minutes. Oh, okay. I missed that one. I'll move approval of the minutes. Okay. Okay, moved by Ms. Brown, seconded by Mr. Perez. Um, so let's uh, I'll call for the question. Call the roll, Ms. Hopper. Margaret Brown. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Mr. Chair, we have a motion made by Margaret Brown, Jason Perez seconded for the approval of item 4A, the approval of the minutes. Thank you, thanks for catching that. Sorry, I missed that folks. And so um, with more item five is information consent items. I don't see anything uh, requested to pull, so we'll move to item six, action agenda items. And uh, 6A, is the independent auditor's report. So I'll call on Elise Chipley, I believe. Is that correct, Marlene? Correct. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Elise Chipley, Office of Audit Services. Agenda item is an action item. Staff is requesting the Risk and Audit Committee to approve the board's independent financial statement auditor, BDO's audit report for the fiscal year ended June, 20, June 30, 2020. I would like to turn it over to BDO staff who are here presenting with me today. Billy, take it away. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. Hello, Chairman, Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the time for us to present the results of the audit to you. With me here today are key leaders of my team, and they'll assist me in presenting the results of the audit. Uh, our full team involved in the audit, as well as the audit work over the GASB schedules we will issue, composed of over 60 plus people, including specialists, actuarial, IT, and valuation specialists. And collectively, we spend a significant amount of time to complete the work that we've been engaged for. Uh, the scope of our audit uh, for the CalPERS CAFR was over the basic financial statements for the year ended June 30th, 2020. Uh, the basic financial statements cover the fiduciary funds as well as each of the proprietary funds. We have three deliverables that we provided for your review. Two of them are audit opinions, and the other is our audit wrap-up report, which includes a summary of our audit work, which is currently on the screen. But before we dive into the summary report, let me give you a summary of attachment one and three. So attachment one is the independent auditor's opinion. Uh, the opinion includes discussion on management's responsibility over the preparation of the financial statements. And the auditor's responsibility is providing as to whether the financial statements are free of material misstatements from a reasonable assurance standpoint. Our audit opinion that we are expecting to issue is an unmodified opinion, which means that it is a clean report. Attachment three is the other opinion, and it's required under governmental auditing standards. It covers internal controls over financial reporting and on compliance, there are no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that we've identified uh, during the audit. Also, from a compliance perspective, the report concludes 
that we did not identify any matters of noncompliance that could have a direct or material effect on the financial statements. Now, going back to the audit wrap-up report on the screen, which is attachment two, uh, with the assistance of my colleague, Steve Franklin, um, which is uh, who's our investments audit partner, and Deepika Nagin, our lead senior manager, we'll walk through the report and highlight key matters associated with the, with the results of the audit. So if we can get both of them elevated uh, at this time, that, that, that'd be great. Thank you. Can we move to slide four? All right, so on this slide, I covered most of the points listed here as part of my uh, discussion of attachment one and two, but some of the other items to highlight here is that all records and information requested were available for our inspection, and most of the audit work was performed remotely this year due to COVID-19. Uh, with leveraging our experience uh, from the prior year and with successful coordination with management, we were able to complete our audit work without issue. There were certain things, a confidential in nature, we had to review on site, but that was limited while most of our requests were provided electronically. Next slide, please. The slide was, uh, this slide was put together for the committee uh, to, to be clear and tra transparent as to what is described in our opinion on what assurance we are providing and to what work we have performed over each of the sections of the CAFR. So with any financial statement audit, we perform our audit and provide assurance over the basic financial statements, which includes the notes to those financial statements. For the other supplementary information section, we also perform audit procedures in relation to the audit of the financial statements. The other supplementary information section includes a breakdown of certain expense categories that are further breakdowns of what is included in the face, including administrative expenses, investment expenses, and so on. There are two sections that are also required uh, with that, that are required under governmental reporting standards to be included with the basic financial statements, but are not required to be audited. And those, uh, those sections are called the Management's Discussion and Analysis Section, or the MDNA, and also the Required Supplementary Information Section. And so BDO has performed limited procedures over the numbers included in these required sections by reviewing them for consistency with the numbers included in the audited financial statements and all audit support provided during the audit. For the other sections included, although they are unaudited, we read those sections as part of the review of the CAFR drafts and any questions and comments were provided to management. Next slide, please. As it relates to the significant accounting policies and pra uh, practices and policies, there are no changes that we noted during the year. Also, there are no adoption of any significant new accounting standards. Now, one of the areas of the audit we do focus on is in the area of significant estimates, which I will go through three of, three of them, which are actually driven estimates. So first off, for the healthcare fund, the estimated claims liability is a liability that uses an actuarial methodology based on historical claims data. And this is for each of the medical plans that are offered by CalPERS to its members. Second, is the estimated liability for future policy benefits to be paid for beneficiaries related to the long-term care fund. The LTC or the long-term care liability is derived from a roll forward method and includes assumptions from the latest valuation report. Now, one significant change to highlight, which has also been mentioned in uh, some of the other committee meetings, uh, is uh, compared to the prior year, there was a key change in the discount rate assumption for long-term care liability from 5.25% to 4%. Third is the area of pension liabilities, which, which are disclosed in footnote seven for cost-sharing plans, including PERF B and PERF C and single defined benefit plans. As part of our audit for each of these three significant estimate areas, we perform procedures over each of these liabilities, including through analytical analyses, sample testing of procedures over accuracy and completeness of data used. And we also independently utilized actuaries to review management's actuarial models and methodology 
calculation and the related assumptions. So based upon the work performed, we noted no issues. Now, our last significant estimate is related to investments, where I'll have Steve Franklin uh, share more about that work. Steve? Steve, are you there? There we go. They've, they've Franklin, given me access now. Can you hear me now? Yes, go yes, ahead. Sir. Go ahead. I have been elevated. Apologies. Uh, thank you. Um, just getting my video there. There we go. So, uh, yes, thank you, Billy. So, for the investments aspect, the the significant estimate that we identified related to was related to private equity and real asset investments, and specifically around the the difference in year ends between many of the investments which have audited financial statements as of twelve thirty one, and Calpers year end which is six thirty. Additionally, the, uh, the the other part of the this estimate related to the lag analysis, and whereas um, whereby Calpers utilizes initially the the three thirty one value. Um, in order to to book the estimates of the private equity and real asset investments, and then um, which is then updated um, based on various analysis to come up with the 630 figures using the 630 numbers from the underlying investments. Uh, similar to as Billy mentioned, we did significant testing around um, th this these areas, including sending confirmations to the investment managers, doing back testing, reliability testing. Um, reviewing audited financial statements and unaudited uh, capital statements from the uh, underlying investment funds, um, in addition to uh, uh, other procedures. Next slide, please. And with that, we're going to move on to the next part of the audit. So the results of the audit. Uh, I'm going to cover two of the corrected misstatements. Uh, there were no uncorrected misstatements during the year. The first item uh, that everyone will notice is related to um, a reclassification. So this had no impact on the uh, on the actual net asset value of the of the funds. This was a reclassification from global global debt securities to short term securities. There were some U.S. Treasury bills that had been classified in the system um, under global debt when they should have been classified under short term securities. So we um, we spoke with management about that, and that uh, reclassification was made. And towards the bottom, I just wanted to highlight quickly, uh, there was an added period adjustment that was booked this year related to, um, for 582 million related to um, real assets valuation that happened last year, but that uh, that was addressed this year and uh, no further comment on that. With that, I will hand it over to, um, to Babika to cover the employer contribution. Thank you, Steve. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, go Perfect. ahead. Perfect. Um, there was one additional reclass entry in the amount of $904 million that had been classified as an employer contribution, which should have been classified as a non-employer contribution. CalPERS has appropriately booked this audit adjustment. We can move to uh, slide nine. The slide discusses the varying levels of deficiencies and the definition at each level. We considered the internal control over financial reporting to help us design our audit procedures. However, we do not express an opinion over the effectiveness of the internal controls. In the next agenda item, we will go into further detail on our control observations. However, we would like to highlight here that there were no material weaknesses identified. Slide 11, please. These next two slides include our other required communications, which are which we are required to communicate to you in accordance with our audit standards. I will highlight certain key items on these pages. First, there were no significant changes in our planned audit strategy or significant risks initially identified. Second, other than the former CIO conflict of interest matter, 
which is being investigated by the California's Fair Political Practices Commission. There were no violations or possible violations of laws or regulations that were noted or relevant during the audits. Next slide. Third, there were no disagreements with management or significant difficulties encountered during our audits. Fourth, due to COVID-19 and the CARES Act, management has assessed the impact to the financial statements and disclosed in the notes of the financial statements the impact to the volatility experienced in the investment por portfolio during the last half of the fiscal year and how it is closely monitoring to assess for any future possible adverse implications. Part of our audit, we have reviewed management's analysis over the impact of COVID-19 and did not take exception to it. And lastly, I wanted to remind you all that as your auditors, we are independent of CalPERS and as required under our audit standards. Thank you. Yeah, so that concludes our presentation for agenda item 6A, and we are happy to take any questions. Thank you, and thank you to you, Billy, and your entire team um, working um, you know, with you the, the first time through um, was, was a pleasure and it had its challenges and, and um, stepped up and met them along with the whole team and CalPERS team. And, and then this year, ready for smooth sailing and, you know, we've been through it all once and, and now we've got the pandemic. So new challenges, uh, new opportunities to do things differently. And we really appreciate the, the fine work by you and your team and all the CalPERS team that, that you worked with as well uh, from, from the risk and audit uh, chair perspective, it was it was a pleasure. So with that, I will go yeah. to our questions. And the first question I have is from, looks like, President Jones. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just want to clarify what a uh, piece of information I may have missed and heard, if you will. Sure. And it was, it's regarding the comments on page six of 13, when you talked about the estimates uh, for uh, private equity, I thought I heard you say that the estimates were based on uh, calendar year end for the balance of the year. So my, if I heard that correctly, then that it is, seems to be inconsistent with our current practice of the private equity lagging a quarter behind, not a half year. Yes, so Steve, you, you wanna address this question? Yeah, no, that would, um, apologies for the confusion. No, that what I was just saying is that many of the audited financial statements, the year end for the underlying funds, RF1231. That's not that, that's not the numbers that that are being used. That was just me saying oh. that that's the fiscal year in for most of those for those underlying funds, which is different than CalPERS, which is as of six thirty. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Apologies for the confusion. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, um, my next questioner is Director Middleton. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, or Mr. Chair, uh, excuse me. Um, Billy, the, uh, I, I just want to reemphasize one very basic point. Uh, you had access to all documents that were requested? Yes, we, we, we had access to everything that we had requested for, whether and, that was electronically or in person. All right. And was there anyone that uh, uh, was not made available to you that you requested availability? No, there was no such situation. All right. And my understanding is uh, from prior conversations with you uh, that uh, staff was uh, cooperative at all times during the course of uh, this audit. Is that correct? Yes, they are very cooperative and accommodating, and a lot of credit should go to them as well, especially during this COVID-19 time. And there are certain things, including 
hard copies that we might have received in the past that had to be scanned, right? So that we can receive it electronically. So a lot of effort on their part as well. All right, thank you. And uh, uh, as you said, this is a clean audit and uh, we're certainly appreciative of seeing that, uh, but we, we will see the facts, whatever they may be here. Uh, I just wanna say on uh, my behalf, since I had the opportunity to interact during the course of this year, that uh, I have nothing but compliments uh, to you, to Sylvia, and to everyone on your team. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, thank you. Um, next, we have Director Brown. Hi. Uh, good evening, almost. Um, I wanted to go back to um, page 126 in the agenda. That's uh, attachment two, and it's the um, corrective misstatements. Um, I uh, I see the two uh, corrective misstatements, but then you talked about 904 million. So where is that in this report? And can you explain to me a little more about what that was? Yeah, so, so the 904 million is, is was a, a misstatement that was corrected. So that was something that um, my team had proposed to management to be corrected because there was certain contributions that were recorded in employer contribution. That's a specific financial statement line item when it should have been a separate line item uh, that should be designated as non-employer contribution. And so that is something that we proposed and then management had then recorded. So that is reflected in, in the CAF or if you look at the basic financial statements in the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in that position. Okay, and so and so it's not on page 126 because it doesn't belong there, is that correct? Uh, page one, what, what is one, what? It's, page the are you correct, the, it's corrected misstatements. Oh, what is there? I'm sorry, 904. I'm sorry, I look at that as 904,000. I apologize. It's 904 million. Oh, yes, I yes. I forgot. Yes. Sorry. I'm thinking, where's that number? Um, <laughs> and so, why did we, so why did we think it was an employer contribution when it was a non employer contribution? Who, where did that come from? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think management had just uh, put, put the amounts included in there, but. You know, this was something that was unique, uh, special funds that had been received from the state. And, and uh, you know, specifically, you know, yeah, this was just something that was a isolated matter. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we had seen it as part of our work. And so we had called it out and, uh, and management had corrected it. Um, thank you. And uh, my apologies for not not seeing it there. I have it circled. I'm like, where's 904 million? Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more requests to um, question or comment. So I'll move approval. I will. Okay. Ms. Brown has moved approval. Do we have a second? This is to approve the, the item. Second. Second, was that Ms. Middleton? Okay, Director Middleton, second. Um, so I'll call for the question. Uh, Ms. Hopper, if you would call the roll. Margaret Brown? Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Moller? Aye. Lisa Middleton? Aye. Jason Perez? Aye. Shonda Wesley? Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee? Aye. Mr. Chair, I have all ayes. Motion made by Margaret Brown, seconded by Lisa Middleton for uh, agenda item 6A, independent auditor's report. Thank you, Ms. Hopper. The ayes have it. Uh, the motion is approved. The independent auditor's report has been approved. So we'll move to 6 the action item agenda items, review of independent auditors management letter. And uh, I believe that is uh, Ms. Chapui. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Lee Chapui again. Agenda item 6B is also an action item. 
staff is requesting the risk and audit committee to approve the board's independent financial statement auditor BDO's management letter. I would like to turn it back to back over to Billy. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Yeah, go ahead, Sylvia. Sylvia will present this section for us. Go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will go over our control findings as it relates to the current year audit. Uh, as we mentioned in the prior agenda item, we did identify two reclassifications. One reclassification related to the government issued treasury bonds that had a short term maturity, which were recorded as global debt securities instead of short term investments. And the other reclassification related to the non employer contributions that were made that were inappropriately classified as an employer contribution. Although both of those classification errors, errors were not material, whether quantitatively or qualitatively, they were proposed by DDO and they were corrected by management. We observed that the errors appeared to be as a result of a lack of control as it relates to the review of the financial statement categories for proper classification for financial reporting purposes. Both corrections had no impact on total investments or total additions, but was only a change within the correct financial statement line. From our observations, we recommend that management implement a control to review all financial statement categories in order to assess whether reclassifications are necessary, including those as it relates to investments and additions. We discussed this with management and management has responded to indicate that as it relates to the investment reclassification, the reason why that originated was because CalPERS was in a transition from a current trade allocation service to a new service and the default settings had not yet been adjusted to align the treasury bill trades to be classified as short term treasuries instead of global debt securities. There really is no user involvement as it relates to the classification of each trade. It, it is an automated process, but once those are appropriately set up, it will be automatically classified appropriately. Uh, management continues to work with the vendors to rectify that in other situations where default settings may need to be updated, and that is uh, currently in process. With respect to the classification of the employer contributions, uh, management has agreed with that finding and they are in the process of implementing additional controls to better identify any additional or out of the ordinary contributions. Those will be added to the financial statement checklist uh, each year to ensure that uh, management is aware and looking out for those classification items. Those will be implemented uh, by September 2021. So that summarizes our current year findings. I did want to summarize the prior year control deficiencies that were identified and the steps that have been taken to remediate those. Uh, prior year, there were two deficiencies that were observed. The first one relates to the review of estimated claim liabilities. CalPERS Healthcare Claims Fund records estimated claim liabilities, including estimates of ultimate claim costs that have been reported but not settled as well as of claims that have been incurred but not reported. In the prior year, we noted that CalPERS did not have a comprehensive review process over the completeness and accuracy of such claim liabilities. We also observed that there had been no evidence of a retrospective analysis that was performed to support the ongoing use of CalPERS's estimate methodologies. We recommended that CalPERS put in place a process to comprehensively review the IBNR estimates and the methodology used for the reasonableness, including for the completeness and accuracy and the information that's included. We also had recommended that CalPERS reconcile the summary third party uh, administrator claim activity to the detailed claim activity on a regular basis. Management responded and took steps during the year to correct for this. The Health Plan Administration Division team completed and implemented a long term care fund procedure and process for changes that details the claims reconciliation. And the team also coordinated with the state controller's office and will be documenting, implementing, and testing the HCF TPA reconciliation of claims summary to the detailed claims for the new PPO contract period coming up. This was effective as of January 1st, 2020. The second finding that we had last year that has also since been remediated was we had observed that the developers in PeopleSoft, Kelpers as general ledger, had access to the production environment, which allows them to bypass the program change management controls. This in itself posed a potential segregation of duties issue. And so we had recommended that management remove the developer access to PeopleSoft production. 
This was done during the year and all developer people soft production access was terminated in November of 2019. And then periodic, periodic people soft user controls were also put into place in order to identify any potential segregation of duties matters going forward. We concur that that has also been remediated during the year. We will open it up for any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any requests for, oh, there we go. Okay, um, Director Brown. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for the follow-up on uh, findings and letting us know that they have been resolved. That's one of my sort of big sticking points. We sometimes have findings internally and we don't actually know how they've been resolved. So very uh, good detail. Um, thank you very much, and I'm glad uh, management and the staff has been able to put those uh, recommended changes into practice. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm seeing no more questions or comments. And, uh, Is this an I action on the approval? Yes. Move approval. Good. Approval moved by and seconded by Ms. Backlin. Yes. Okay, seeing no further comment, I'll call for the question. Ms. Hopper, please call the roll. Margaret Brown. Aye. Frank Rufino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. Jason Perez. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Mr. Chair, I have the motion being made by Margaret Brown, Lynn Packwin seconding it. I have all eyes, and it's for the approval of item 6B, review of independent auditor's management letter. Okay, the item is approved. Um, I just wanna, again, say thank you to Mr. Kim, Ms. Mack, and the entire team from BDO and the entire CalPERS team that um, supported the efforts in the audit. Um, it really made my job as uh, BAC chairman much easier. Everyone was very helpful and uh, I uh, look forward to continuing to uh, see progress with CalPERS uh, performance in terms of their being responsive to the audits and every little thing that we find that can be a potential opportunity for improvement. I think over the years, it's getting harder to find those little opportunities, but uh, there are hopefully we'll always continue to seek to improve. So thank you for your presentations and your answers to our questions. So with that, we'll move to 6C, Independent Financial Statement Auditor Selection. Um, Ms. Nix. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am Michelle Nix, CalPERS controller and team member. This item presents the process and results of the art request for proposal initiated this year for the independent external auditor. The board has delegated to the risk and audit committee the authority to conduct the selection of the board independent financial statement auditor using a subcommittee of the RAC and to recommend the finalists to the board. On May 5th, 2020, CalPERS released RFP number 2020-8853 to initiate a competitive selection process to engage the services of a qualified audit firm to perform audits of CalPERS financial statements for fiscal years 2020 through 2021, and, also, and then again through 2024-2025. CalPERS received five responsive proposals from BDO USA LLP, Clifton Larson Allen LLP, Deloitte and Touche LLP, I Bailey LLP, and KPMG LLP. All proposals pass both technical and fee proposal evaluations. This item is for the subcommittee of is for the subcommittee of the Risk and Audit Committee or the RAC to present the highest scoring finalists for the independent audit financial statement auditor. On RAC approval. CalPERS will enter contract negotiations with the approved finalists. If contract negotiations are unsuccessful with the approved finalists, this item also seeks approval to enter contract negotiations with the second highest scoring finalist, as allowed per the related request for proposal 2020-8853. 
At today's meeting, um, the subcommittee is presenting the top highest scoring proposer from the table above or in the, in the actual attachment. Um, BDS, BDO USA LLP with a total of 968 points for approval by the RAC as the independent financial statement auditor. KPMG LLP and Clifton Larson Allen LLP were the second and third ranked proposers with 958 and 950 total points respectively. I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, for discussion and direction. Thank you, Ms. Nix. Um, I'm not seeing any new requests to discuss, so at this point, uh, I would entertain a motion or further discussion. I will say it was um, a very difficult and uh, challenging selection process in that we had such strong candidates and the scores ended up being, being quite close. Um, I, I'm, I'm pleased that, Cal, that uh, CalPERS is able to attract such a a strong showing among qualified candidates for, for this opportunity. So uh, any thoughts from anyone before we, so I would entertain a motion to, oh, Director Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I would like to echo uh, your comments. This is an extremely close and very difficult decision because we had truly outstanding candidates that were presented to us. Uh, but uh, a recommendation was uh, scores were received by the committee uh, and I'd like to recommend uh, that we are, make the motion that we approve uh, the staff recommendation. And I'll second. Do we have a second? Director Brown seconds. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call for the question. Um, Ms. Hopper, please call the roll. Margaret Brown. Aye. Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma. Aye. Lisa Middleton. Aye. Jason Aye. Perez. Aye. Shonda Wesley. Aye. Lynn Paquin for Betty Yee. Aye. Mr. Chair, I have the motion being made by Lisa Middleton, seconded by Margaret Brown. All ayes for the approval of agenda item 6C, independent financial statement auditor selection. Okay, the motion is approved and uh, congratulations to BDO and a really heartfelt thank you to everyone else who competed. As, as, as Director Middleton said, it was a very close and uh, you know, very um, encouraging process. So, okay, moving on to item 6B, the RFP for Parallel Valuation and Certification Services, and we'll call on Ms. Archuleta. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. This agenda, I, oh sorry, for the Archuleta CalPERS team. This agenda item is a request to release an RFP for actuarial consulting services. The selected contractor would provide a parallel valuation each year to the valuations produced by the actuarial office. Currently, these valuations are performed on a triannual schedule, auditing public agency valuations, the state and school valuations, and finally, the judges and legislatures valuations. Best practices guidelines suggest that parallel valuations are performed every three to seven years. Additionally, the actuarial office recommends that after the three-year cycle of parallel valuations, the fourth year will not have a parallel valuation performed. Instead, this fourth year would coincide with our ALM cycle. Recall that during our ALM cycle, a separate external audit is done on the experience study. This option will save the organization up to $100,000 over the life of the RFP. This concludes my presentation. I will now open it up to any questions. Thank you. Um, I will call on Director Brown for the question. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so by uh, not doing it the fourth year, uh, is this going to be less oversight? So we're saying we're only gonna do parallel evaluations for three years and not do it on the fourth? Yeah, so currently, um, you know, here we do, we pick a specific set of valuations that we would do a parallel val on. 
And so, you know, be a pe- the, this year you're going to hear from um, Buck in just a second on, on the, the uh, judges and legislature's evaluation system. And so next year is our ALM cycle. And so, yes, in that fourth year, we would not do a parallel evaluation at all. Yeah, I don't, and I don't, okay, I don't support that. All right, thank you. Okay, Director Rubicaba. Uh, thank you. Hope you're still muted, uh, Director Rubicaba. There you go. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not on this committee, but I'm, I'm interested in following the actuarial action. Uh, in the executive summary, it, it I just wanna make sure I understand the language. It talks about an actuarial audit, and sometimes talks about actuarial review, and sometimes talks about parallel valuation. But what services are actually provided through this RFP? Is it just the parallel valuation, or is there also an actuarial audit? And if there is, can you tell me the difference between the actuarial, actuarial valuation audit and a parallel valuation? Sorry. Sure, it's actually just a parallel valuation. So. Every year they would pick the set of valuations that they wanted to audit and they would come up with independent liability numbers. And uh, I believe the threshold is 5% within ours to prove reasonability. Um, you know, and then after the whole RFP is over, they do a follow-up like, you know, this is our last contract is expiring right now and they do a follow-up, um, a closing remark on, you know, anything that they find. So. You know, any little um, calculation issues that they see, they, you know, we tweak those numbers, um, you know, or, you know, as they tell us if there's anything that they see that's a problem with our valuation system and our calculation. Does that thank answer you. your question? Yes, thank okay. you very much. Okay, Director Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Archuleta, the option of foregoing one out of four years of the parallel audits, is that the recommendation of staff or is that simply an option that you are presenting to the board? Uh, that is the recommendation of staff. We are still within best practice guidelines if we do that and we saw it as an opportunity to also save some money for the organization. The ALM process, is that duplicative of some of the processes that would be going on uh, if we were to do the parallel audit in the fourth year? So during the ALM cycle, we also do a demographic experience study. Mm -hmm. And um, during that process, we have an external actuary auditing our experience study. So in that fourth year, while we won't have a parallel valuation done, we will still have an independent auditor looking at our experience study and our assumption setting. All right. So, uh, in terms of actual oversight, do you uh, do you see any differences? I mean, I think that I, I, as long as we stay within best practices, I think we're okay. Um, we're still well within the three seven year guideline, so um, this is why we're recommending the change. Okay. And uh, whether we accept the change or do not accept the change, we can still go forward with the balance of the RFP, correct? Uh, correct, there's actually two options on the agenda item. The okay. other option is just the regular schedule, which you know we would request, we would do another, another RFP, and then next year, instead of skipping a parallel val valuation year, we would go ahead and do the parallel valuation. How much time does the parallel valuation take? Um, it takes roughly three months, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Director Rubicaba. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ms. I had a question on the uh, experience study. Is the experience study on the um, a demographic assumptions or is it also on the demographic and economic assumptions? You could explain. I'm sorry. It's an experience study on both. Um, and then the ALM obviously is the study on the discount rate, but there's inflation in there. Got it. Thank you very much for, clarific for that clarification. Okay, I see no more requests to speak on the, on the 
or ask questions. Mr. So, Chair. Um, cool. Mr. Rufino. Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a quick question. What prompt for that? What prompt the change or the suggested action? Is that something that we have done in the in the past? <clears throat> I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat the question because I think you said what prompted the change? If you kind of cut well, what, what prompted the suggested change? Have we skipped on the fourth year in the past or, or is that have we've done this in the past at all? Um, that's a good question. I think we used to not do a, a parallel evaluation on the fourth year, but I can't say for certain. Um, I could maybe ask Scott that question. But this year, the reason um, that we decided to do the recommendation was, you know, the RFP, the current RFP is finishing, and this is the last year. So we will have to create another one if we want to continue to do parallel valuations. And we saw it as an opportunity to save money for the organization, even though we're staying within best practices. So I'm not sure, if, Scott, do you want to, did we skip in that poster? I thought we Sure. So maybe I can add, add, um, add, a, add a, some comments on that. Um, normally, you know, during the ALM cycle, that's happening next year, we always have a, a review of the um, experience. That, you know, and that's going to be setting a discount rate, um, the economic assumptions, as well as all the uh, demographic assumptions, and that is reviewed every four years to, to line up with the ALM process. So what would happen is if we go ahead and we have a parallel val in the same year, which is gonna be happening is you're gonna be reviewing the one group, you know, one of those three sets of groups based on the old assumptions because the new assumptions haven't been set yet. So what happens is basically you're having two audits done or parallel evaluations done in the same year. You have the the um, say they're doing state and schools. They're going to be doing the state and school review, and you're also going to be having the audit done or the review done on the experience site. So you're basically having two reviews done on the same year. So it's double the work. Normally, you'd want it, we allocate one portion every year, and so the fourth, you know, that fourth year would be the experience study. You know, it lines up that it's everything getting covered. And as a reminder, you also have your independent auditor reviewing the system as well. They're looking at our assumptions, they're looking um, at our processes. Now they don't do a parallel val where they take our data and run through their system and, and do a person by person comparison. This is what this is. But you're basically in the AOM cycle, if we do if we don't make a change, you're basically gonna have a um, two parallel evaluations done, an audit done on the um, experience, and you're gonna have the independent audit review as well. Um, yes, sir, that's like triple oversight. That's fine if you wanna go ahead and have that, but um, considering everything is being, we have the oversight every year, this would be an opportunity to save some funds for the plans and for the system. So that, that, that's why our suggestion uh, in terms of you know, we still meet best practices, um, but we're saving some money. And it kind of lines up with the timing of everything else we do. But obviously, you know, it's up to the, the committee and the board on which which route they choose. Yeah. Great. And thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Taronda. That was helpful. Okay, thank you. It, it sounds also like then what you're saying, um, not to put too sharp a point on, but it sounds like it creates an additional burden on staff to try to do all that all at one time if uh, they don't really need to during that fifth year. That's correct. There's there's extra work involved for some of the staff, but you know we've been doing that um, as far as I can remember, so that wasn't really an issue. Okay, Director Brown. Thank you, um, and that was my question. Thank you, Mr. Miller, for putting a point on that. Is that if it's a workload issue, that's a different uh, issue for me versus 
uh, you know, um, it's the year that we do the ALM. We've, I, I don't want to save a hundred thousand dollars and have less oversight. Um, I, I mean, we, the, this committee, I'm not sure what committee tried to do it. And when they tried to eliminate uh, the guy who does the transcripts and it's like, no, 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 I don't want to save money to eliminate oversight. If it's duplicative, we can talk about it. If it's a workload issue, we should definitely talk about it. But if this fourth year uh, is important and we get good information out of these parallel valuations, I don't, this is not the time to stop doing these parallel evaluations in, in my opinion. Um, and I'm not sure who's gonna make a motion on that, but that's where I'm at, thank you. Yeah, so Scott, what do we lose? Um, as Director Brown is um, pointing out, if we're losing something in oversight, are we losing anything in oversight by not doing a parallel evaluation in the fourth year? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. I, I just going to repeat your question. You're asking, are we missing something if we don't do a parallel yeah, evaluation? Uh, yeah. that so That's my question. This gets, um, we will review public agency valuations in one year, then state and school valuations the following year. And then in the third year, we'll do the judges and legislatures and then the 59 survivor program. And then the following year, we would just go right back and do public agency valuations again. And so all that all this recommendation would do was delay that one year and do, you know, a, a parallel valuation on the public agency valuations the following year. So we're just going to skip that one year during the ALM cycle. And during the ALM cycle, we would have an, an independent audit, um, actuarial firm audit our experience study. So it would be a different kind of um, oversight, if you will, because they would look at our experience study and not our actual valuation, you know, product. And then we would start again on the three-year cycle after that. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, I see no more requests to speak. Um, it's the committee's pleasure. I would entertain a motion for the staff's recommendation or? I move that we don't change anything. I'm not seeing a second. We have another motion. I would offer a substitute motion that we uh, accept staff's recommendation. Okay, just a point of order. I don't think we have a motion. Hang on, hang on, Frank. Uh, I don't think we have a motion to substitute for because uh, Ms. Brown's motion did not get a second. So. I think Ms. Middleton's motion is the motion looking for a second, and I think Frank is seconding it. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. That's good. Okay, so any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I will call for the question and ask Ms. Hopper to call the vote. Margaret Brown? No. Frank Rafino for Fiona Moore? Yes. Lisa Middleton? Aye. Jason Perez? Aye. Sonda Wesley? Aye. Lynn Packer for Betty E. Aye. Mr. Chair, I have the motion made by Lisa Middleton and seconded by Frank Rafino for Fiona Ma to approve item agenda 6D. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hopper. The item is approved. Um, and we move on to item seven, information item seven, a third party valuation and certification. And that looks like uh, calling on Ms. Chapui. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Louise Chapui, Office of Audit Services. Just item seven a is an information item. Global completed its independent review of the actuarial valuations of the judges' retirement system, retirement system two, legislators' retirement system, and the 1959 survivor program as of June 30, 2019. A global staff is here to present their report, and I would like to turn it over to them. You're up. 
Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I am here, of course, to present the results of uh, parallel valuations and audits of the CalPERS actuarial valuation reports. Uh, those specifically do under task six of the current contract. Uh, this includes coverage of the June 30th, 2019 valuations of the 1959 Survivor Benefit Program, the Judges Retirement Program, Judges Retirement Program 2, and the Legislature's Retirement System. What we do uh, in these parallel valuations is to see whether we can reproduce results within 5% if we start with the same data and assumptions um, and set of methods as the CalPERS Actuarial Office. I'm pleased to report that we were able to do that. Additionally, we review the assumptions and methods used for reasonableness and consistency with actuarial standards of practice. Uh, we found that in every case, they uh, were certainly reasonable and complied with actuarial standards of practice. Uh, we also review the reports for uh, content uh, that is thorough and understandable and complies with actuarial standards of practice regarding communication. We found that those were fulfilled. In general, we find, as in our earlier audits, that the work of the Actuarial Office of CalPERS with respect to the plans covered in this task uh, is of very high quality. And we would say that board members uh, may be very confident that uh, the actuarial work is being conducted in a very, very capable way. Uh, all of that said, we did have a few suggestions, which you've seen in our reports, as to ways in which the valuation reports for these systems might be enhanced. Uh, those suggestions have been shared with the leadership of the Actuarial Office of CalPERS for their consideration. I emphasize, however, that if any of those suggestions were adopted, they would not in any significant way change the results reported in, in the reports or um, any actions taken upon them. And with that, I would be happy to entertain questions. Um, any requests to speak? Let me just double check. No, no questions or comments. So thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Uh, anything else there, Ms. Chipley? Okay. I don't I think believe so, Mr. It. Chair. This is an information item. Okay, that does it for that item. So on to 7B, Enterprise Risk Management Framework Preview. Um, Mr. Forrest Grimes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, and members of the board. Forrest Grimes, CalPERS team. It's nice to be with you, um, as always. Item 7B is an information item and I'm going to update the committee on the current state of enterprise risk management efforts. Uh, risk assessments added a COVID lens this year, as you might imagine. Could we get the presentation up, please? I'm specifically looking for attachment one enterprise. There we go. Thank you very much. So this is the Enterprise Risk Management Dashboard. This is a very high level scorecard. And this year you can see that we actually, if we scroll down to, towards the bottom, you would see that we not only added um, uh, climate risk, but we also added long-term care to the dashboard, which now we have 10 enterprise risks. The arrows that you see on this report indicate the, how the risk is trending. And the comments column provides a brief overview of the status of the risk as it now stands. Can we advance to uh, attachment four, please, which I think is two pages up. While we're doing that, attachment four, there it is. Um, this is a new report that we're providing this year, and I think this really enhances uh, the framework, the risk management framework, and provides that next level of maturity that we're always trying to bring as we review this with you annually. Uh, this is the developing risk report, and basically, 
This identifies risks that are not yet well understood. And what we intend to do with these risks is analyze and monitor them. We also will implement low cost, low regret mitigations uh, if available. And really the, what I just said really is that we will um, implement things uh, that we really don't have to spend a whole lot of resources on because we're not sure how effective they might be until we better understand the risks. Uh, so we would not spend a lot of resources on mitigate, mitigating these risks at this time. Uh, the identified developing risks include extended pandemic, and I think we're seeing uh, some of that at this point. The new working model, uh, policy uncertainties and social instability, and third party risk. More to follow on those as we proceed. Uh, next page, please. What you're gonna be seeing is our heat map. Um, and this really, uh, when this comes up, uh, you'll see that the impact is, is on the y-axis, probability is on the x-axis, um, and the velocity is reflected by the size of the bubble, larger being uh, faster uh, to come to fruition. Uh, the gray uh, really indicates the 2019 results, while the white plotting indicates the 2020 results, the current results. And noteworthy changes are that we added climate change and long-term care, as I previously mentioned. Uh, both are in the higher risk upper right quadrant. And if you look at this a little carefully, you'll see that that is uh, immediate action required is what that would indicate. Uh, I don't think anyone would disagree with, with that on both of those fronts. Um, information security, you can see, has been reduced due to better controls being in place. And the governance and control environment risk has increased uh, due to the need for additional controls that are either now being implemented or under development. With that, I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any requests uh, for questions or comments. Let me just double check here. Uh, oh, it looks like no questions or comments, but I, I will say that I find, I always find this uh, risk discussions um, to be really important and helpful. And uh, I really appreciate the clarity of the presentation. I think that's reflected by the fact that we understood it and didn't have a bunch of questions. So I do see um, Ms. Packman has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's more of a comment. I just wanted to say that I really do appreciate the addition of the developing risk areas and along with the sustainability, the, the climate risk and the long-term care risk added to the matrix. I think that that will really help and keep us all um, focused on where the risk lies for the enterprise. So thank you. Uh, you're you quite have welcome. a comment. Have a comment from Ms. Middleton as well. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, staff for the work. This is really impressive. And when I look at the heat map, uh, I see that uh, pension funding in terms of its impact is, uh, uh, as an issue is growing and it is already at uh, at the peak on this map. And I know staff is working on, uh, on issues around this. Some of them are systemic uh, for us, but uh, I think we cannot lose sight of uh, the grave risks that are associated with the cost of uh, our uh, pension programs. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Middleton. I, um... And I wanted to just re just uh, reiterate that the reason that this risk is perceived to be higher is twofold because um, basically we think that COVID has created some financial stress, as you mentioned previously, on our employers. And additionally, you can see that velocity has increased, and I think that this really is attributed to the speed with this the, with this pandemic and how quickly um, something can really happen to the revenue sources. Uh, we didn't really think that would be possible previously, but this pandemic is 
creating a lot of issues that didn't seem like they were possible uh, previously. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, thanks again for the presentation and uh, the answers. And uh, seeing no further quests to speak, um, I think that closes that out. And uh, so we'll move on to summary of committee direction. Back to Ms. Timberlake Diodano. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I I did not record any committee direction. I, I didn't catch any either. <laughs> like there's concurrence on that. And I don't believe we have any requests for public comment. Uh, Mr. Fox, is that true? That is correct, Mr. Chair. There are no callers on this committee. Okay, thank you, sir. So that wraps up open session. Um, We'll leave this and, and transition to closed session. And uh, I think uh, we'll see you all there shortly. Mr. Chair, if I could just compliment you on uh, doing triple duty today, having to chair three different meetings. <laughs> Congratulations, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm just trying to cope with all these different little devices. So. Uh, not natural to me, so I appreciate the, the encouragement. Thank you. Okay, see you soon. I'm closed. All right.